All right. I'm just going to go through some housekeeping items for this evening while we get ready to get started. As you can tell, everybody in the audience has been muted for tonight's discussion, but that does not mean we don't want you to interact throughout tonight's panel discussion. Feel free to use the chat feature. Please make sure your chat is directed to all panelists and attendees. Our team members, Kayla McDaniel and Michelle Kobjock in the audience will be answering your questions throughout, questions throughout tonight's event. Also, as you can see, all of our panelists tonight have the wonderful hashtag Chicks Talk STEM. So please engage with us at Chick Tech and Talk STEM on social media using the hashtag Chicks Talk STEM. All right. I'm going to quickly introduce myself. Uh, I am one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event with Talk STEM. My name is Melissa Schwass, and I am the Chick Tech Chapter Director here in Dallas. Chick Tech is a national nonprofit that was founded in 2012. Chick Tech aims to increase the number of girls and women in STEM, STEAM, and technology by providing hands-on high school workshops for high school-aged females. These workshops are 100% free, so that includes the workshop materials, transportation, meals, giveaways, everything is free. While the nonprofit was founded in 2012, we are brand new to Dallas, so we're looking for help. So if you're a teacher, student, someone who works in technology or who does not, or likes fire alarm testing, feel free to reach out to us after the event for more information. Now I'll quickly hand this over to my, co my cohort, Koshi Dingro, the, the CEO and founder of TalkSTEM. Thanks everyone. Koshi, you may be muted. Thank you. Oh, maybe that with just the right amount of time to, <laughs> uh, nothing like a live event. Um, it's so great to be here. I was looking through the chat. We've got people from all over. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Koshi Dingra. I'm the founder and CEO of the Talk STEM nonprofit organization and so excited to partner with Chick Tech Dallas chapter, Melissa. Um, a quick summary about Talk STEM. Um, we're a nonprofit founded in 2015. Uh, Talk STEM is all about reaching all K through 12 age children, especially those in underrepresented groups when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEAM, where the A is for arts, integrated education and careers. A word, since I'll be talking a lot through the next hour, I use the term STEM and STEAM interchangeably because I see arts as being tightly connected to STEM. So I kind of see them as synonyms in my own mind. Um, Talk STEM delivers impact by supporting the communities that support students. We work hard to expand and provide innovative educational programs to these communities, whether they're in school or out of school. So we work with um, partners like Chick Tech, Dallas Arboretum, Dallas Museum of Art, Frontiers of Flight Museum, Dallas Zoo, the Girl Scouts, Girls Inc., uh, school districts, private schools, charter schools, and more. Our goal is to foster STEM or STEAM identities in all our children and to break the barriers that so often prevent girls and others from feeling like they belong in STEAM cultures, whether in the classroom, outside the classroom, or in the workplace. I firmly believe that every person is a STEAM person and every space is a STEAM space. But sometimes we just need to make these varied connections to STEAM explicit to highlight this critically important point. So you're gonna meet an eclectic group of women with deep knowledge in varied fields. Their careers and stories will seem quite different. I'm lucky to know these women and I can share that they represent the myriad leaders and diverse STEAM integrated career pathways open to all our girls. Before we get into our Signs of Wine um, presentation, because this is also a virtual happy hour, um, I'd like to quickly share the STEM lens of the women you are about to meet in other words, some snapshots of how they see the world around them. So you can see here, we've got some photos and questions contributed by the women you're about to meet. Um, a STEM lens is a term that I've coined and it's basically a quick and easy way to share the way you see the world around you, your real world through your constantly changing and developing STEM lens. Um, I'd love to also invite you to talk STEM series of four virtual exhibitions entitled her STEM lens, where you can view these and other contributions on a virtual reality platform. It's all free. Um, her STEM lens is powered by Comerica Bank and 
launched on February 11th, the International Day of Girls and Women in Science. It will end on May 31st and the final exhibition will go up early next month. You can learn more and access this virtual exhibition on talkstem.org. So now uh, we're gonna get on with it. I hope you all brought a favorite beverage. I have mine here. It is my pleasure to introduce someone who's gonna help us make some of those connections explicit when it comes to the world of wine. Shelley Wilfong is a wine educator, wine writer, and wine podcaster, also an old friend. Our daughters brought us together years ago in elementary school. She founded the Dallas Women's Wine Club in 2020 and the podcast, This is Texas Wine in 2021. She holds a certified specialist of wine designation through the Society of Wine Educators, as well as a level three advanced award from the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. So let's sit back and learn a little bit more about the science of wine. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And this is actually my first STEM or STEAM panel because in the past I've always avoided math and science, but wine has been the lens through which I started to appreciate science. And I'm guessing you could tell which photo was mine. It was of the bud break in the vineyard. So I am going to share my screen so that you can see a brief presentation. We don't have a ton of time today, but I want to talk to you about evaluating wine like a scientist. It's really more than wine tasting. It's using all of your senses to inform your appreciation and enjoyment of wine. Now, you don't have to use this technique every single time you taste wine. Sometimes you just want something delicious to drink, but I think you'll find that you enjoy wine more if you stop to consider it with a more critical lens. So moving forward, the first sense that we generally use when we evaluate wine is our sight, of course, but it's more than just, would you like a red, a white, or maybe a pink wine? There are so many things you can learn from the color of wine. As you can see on this chart on the left, wine comes in many colors in the natural world. And then you can also find wines that are not so natural. I've had a blue wine, but that was not created by uh, the soil, the sun, and the plant material that was created in a lab. Um, you can also tell how old a wine might be by its color because red wine loses color as it ages and white wine takes on a more brown color as it ages. Believe it or not, you can even tell perhaps where uh, grapes were grown because wines that are from um, grapes grown in warmer climates take on more color whereas wines that are grown in cooler climates are generally more pale. So this is just a tip of the iceberg on what our eyes can tell us about the wine that we're enjoying. We can't really talk about wine appreciation without mentioning Dr. Ann Noble, who is a retired professor at UC Davis in California. She felt that it's not that people didn't know how to evaluate wine, it's that they didn't have a shared vocabulary to do so. And so she invented what we now call the wine aroma wheel. And I know that you can't see all the little words on this wheel, but you can easily find this with a Google search, the wine aroma wheel. And basically how this works is that when you are evaluating a wine, you start in the center of the circle and you look for kind of the big categories. Are you smelling fruit? Are you smelling flowers? Do you get an earthy or woody or caramel aroma? And then working from the center out, you can identify more specifically the smells that you get. Now, many times when people are just starting out in wine tasting, they focus only on fruit, but in fact, that's just one of many types of aromas that you get from wine. And we can't talk about smell without talking about taste. They're really so intertwined that when we evaluate a wine, we think that we're just getting um, the taste, but in fact, the smell is what's informing the taste. So this is really the meat of what I'm going to challenge you with tonight. I want you to think more deeply about the wine descriptors that you use to um, evaluate your wine. On the top line here, we have three different versions of pineapple. On your left, you'll see a pineapple that looks a bit underripe. It's still a bit green. And you can imagine what that would taste like. It's not bad, it's just, it's uh, rather lean. The pineapple in the middle, you can see it's golden, it's juicy, it's ripe. 
And then the next pineapple has been on the grill. So you can imagine that it has developed some caramelized flavors and it's a totally different taste sensation. So when you're smelling your wine, and if you have it there beside you, please join in. And in fact, whatever you may be drinking other than water, it, if it has a smell, really think about what that smell is. But don't just stop with the type of fruit, but let's talk about the fruit quality. Do you get something that's, that's really underripe or something that is fully ripe or is it caramelized or even burned? Another way to think about it with a red fruit is, is it a fresh strawberry just picked from the field or is it more like strawberry jam or baked strawberry? I also wanna mention when it comes to wine descriptors that everyone has a bit of a different sensory threshold. So how much do you mind? Uh, a smell of barnyard in your wine, which sounds crazy, but it's actually can really add a lot of nuance and a nice quality to wine within a certain level. And people have a different threshold. So some people would find it off-putting, others think it's just great. The same with the smell of petrol or gasoline in wine. Now here are some characteristics of wine that really impact whether or not we enjoy wine, but don't have a lot to do with smell and taste. The little creamer represents the wine's body. Wine can be light-bodied, medium-bodied, or full-bodied, and I equate that to a feeling in your mouth that is like skim milk, whole milk, or cream. Some people don't like that heavy feel of a wine. Some love it. It's really personal preference. Um, the, the molecular structure of alcohol is on this slide to represent the alcohol in wine. Now we know how it makes us feel in our body, but what does that feel like in your mouth? Well, alcohol can give a weight to a wine that makes it seem more full body. You can also sometimes get a little whiff of it in your nose. It's not that it smells, but it may burn the hairs in your nose. It may also burn your throat as you swallow. And people have a different sensitivity to alcohol as well. Sugar is represented on the bottom of the slide. It's very common to smell a wine and think it smells sweet, but I would caution you about this because sweet and dry is a different scale than the kind of juicy ripe fruit, which may actually be what you mean. So it's good to be specific with your words here. The lemons represent acidity, which is the mouthwatering sensation that you get when you swallow. And that's a great characteristic for a wine. It makes it very easy to pair with food. But some people, if a wine is too acidic, it tastes tart, and that's not always a, flavor, a sensation that people like. And then finally, on the bottom there, you see sandpaper, which represents tannins. Imagine that you're eating a raw walnut. The drying sensation that you get in your mouth is a result of the tannins in the walnut. Well, wine has the same thing, and it comes from the seeds and the stems of a wine. And it can be very overwhelming in a young wine from certain regions and certain winemaking techniques. Some people love it and some people shy away. But these are just some factors that impact whether or not you may enjoy a wine. So how can you become a better wine taster? There are a couple things that you can do. And one is to smell everything you have the opportunity to, not just flowers and fruit, but um, smell anything around the house, smell, um, petrol, really smell it and think if I ever experienced this in a wine, you can buy kits to do that, but there's so many things around you. Go into your spice cabinet and grab a spice and just smell it without looking at the label and see if you can identify it. Another thing that can help your wine tasting is if you're having trouble identifying any of these components, like maybe tannins, it's so helpful to taste two wines or more side by side rather than just trying to drink one wine and understand something about it. So if you don't understand tannins, try to drink a very low tannin Pinot Noir and next to it, drink a wine with much higher tannins and just see the difference when um, compared one to the next. And then finally, science gives us so much good information to debunk the many myths that exist in the wine industry. From the tongue map, do you remember that, that you can only taste sweetness on the tip of your tongue, et cetera, that's been debunked. Next, the sulfites in wine give you headaches. That's been debunked. Uh, there are so many wine words that don't have good definitions and so much marketing that's easy to fall prey to, but science gives us the answers. And it also tells us that in fact, women are better, more effective wine tasters than men, specifically women in their childbearing years. 
there is science on this. I have a lot of resources that I would be happy to share with you. And this is a, a great time to also mention that the one sense that we didn't talk about is our sense of hearing, because we don't generally use that in wine evaluation, but maybe we hear a bit of a pop of a champagne bottle. Maybe we hear some bubbles from our champagne. And most importantly, we hear a clink of glasses when we share wine with friends. So thanks for letting me share this. And um, I'll turn this back over to Koshi. Thank you so much, uh, Shelly. Oh my gosh, you managed to, we were just chatting about, you know, I gave it such little time <laughs> to cram everything in. Um, for those of you who do enjoy wine, um, there's obviously so much more to know about it. And what's cool is whether we, we were chatting about this earlier too, whether it's tea, whether it's coffee, you know, whatever it is, the cool thing about STEM, science, math, whatever, you can always put a STEM spin on it. So really the world is open for your exploration and you can look at it any which way you like. And so I think whether you're talking to well, in this case, we're talking to adults, which is why we're talking about, you know, wine. We wouldn't do this with kids, obviously. But, uh, you know, you can do things that kids are really into and put a spin on it. And as an educator um, who has done basically nothing but education for 30 plus years, I would say that, you know, that's really the secret to uh, engaging education. You know, make it relevant, make it interesting, make it fun. Um, all right. So thank you again, Shelley. And I had so many questions, but... I'll just go get to you after this Probably and later. ask you about those. Yes, maybe later. I remember I read an article recently about all of the different, you know, glasses. And there was a fascinating article, not just about the shapes, but also about the thickness of the glass and how that affects um, taste. It's really about your senses. So there's so much that you can just keep digging into something as simple, maybe not so simple as wine, but you name it. It is now my pleasure to move to our panel discussion. Um, and I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists and then ask them to introduce uh, them, uh, themselves. Um, on our panel today, we have Maya Liebman, uh, CIO of American Airlines and Talkstand board member. Cassandra McKinney, Executive Director of Retail Banking at Comerica. Dr. Olga Romero, Founding Principal of Dallas Hybrid Prep in Dallas ISD. Um, and very sadly, Claire Hader, who was going to be on this panel, had a last minute conflict and is not able to join us. Um, this is going to be quite an informal discussion. Uh, after all, we are doing it during happy hour. <laughs> so um, please do use the chat to submit questions. I will try to remember to check and Melissa will remind me if I forget. Um, and um, what I'm going to do now is panelists. Um, I'm going to ask each panelist and maybe we can begin with Maya, to please introduce yourselves and share something unexpected about you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Koshi. And thanks, Shelley. Um, unfortunately, that was such a compelling talk that I finished all my wine right during that. So now um, I maybe if there's a break, I can run and get some more. Um, so I, my name is Maya Liebman. Uh, as Koshi said, I have responsibility for the technology organization for American Airlines. I've worked for American for a quarter of a century, like over 25 years. Um, I worked in a lot of different areas, a lot of different departments, um, and I worked in and out of the technology organization, but I always kept coming back to it because I love STEM. I love the mindset. I love the idea that there are questions that you can ask that have always seemed elusive. And if you really work at it, you can, you can get an answer to it. Um, something that is uh, unexpected about me is that I grew up um, and still spend a lot of time in my childhood home, which is completely round. It has no 90 degree angles. Even the windows are round. And um, Perhaps this is what got me uh, interested in STEM. Um, we used to always joke around a lot that when I'm when we were bad, I have a lot of sisters, brothers, and my parents would say, go sit in the corner. We couldn't because there were no corners to sit in. I did not know that. Thank you, Maya, for sharing. Um, uh, next, Cassandra, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be with you. I'm Cassandra McKinney. And as Koshi shared, uh, I lead the retail bank at Comerica. And uh, my, I've been in banking for uh, over 25 years now. And prior to that, uh, with IBM. And 
I am so excited this uh, evening for one, uh, sponsoring her STEM lens that Coach C mentioned earlier this evening. I hope you all get a chance to stop by and experience that. Uh, at Comerica, we really pride ourselves in raising expectations of what a bank can be. And we do that in our community as with her STEM lens, as well as for our customers and our colleagues. And it has just been an exciting role for me uh, to lead the retail bank. It allows me to serve both our consumer and small business customers across our 430 banking centers in, in five states and ensure that we are providing experiences that help our team serve our customers well. I also uh, have, while I lead a busy career life, uh, I have a husband of 20, 34 years, adult children, and they keep me quite grounded. My unexpected is very different than Maya's <laughs> in that I find myself as a, chem a banker or a chemical engineer turned banker. And many would ask, how do you get from there to here? And my response is always around the fact that I follow my passion and my purpose. And it has led, it led me to a very, very different career path than what I intended. I look forward to sharing more about that. Thank you, Cassandra. Last but not least, Olga, uh, please do um, introduce yourself. Thank you, Kashi. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening, panelists. My name is Dr. Olga Romero, and I am the founding principal at Dallas Hybrid Prep, which is the first official hybrid school in Dallas ISD and almost in the, the state of Texas. Um, I've been in education for the past 10 years. Before that, I during those 10 years, I've been a teacher, I've been an instructional coach, I've been an assistant principal, and this will be pretty much my fourth year as a principal um, full time. Before that, I worked in public relations and advertising for almost 15 years. And I share with Maya the experience of the airline because I used to work for Southwest Airlines, the competitor of American Airlines. We're friends, we're friends. Um, but still, aviation and STEM has always been part of my interest. And our school, our new Dallas Hybrid Prep, will have actually um, STEM project-based learning with some influence of aviation and astrophysics, because we strongly believe that that is the future for here in Dallas. Um, one thing that is very unexpected that a lot of people don't know about me is that when I was in elementary school, I was actually an archery champion. So that was one thing that I loved, but as you grow older, your eyes don't work as well as when you're little. But archery is a lot of STEM. It's a lot of sight. It's a lot about target. It's about wind. It's about force. And I always felt compelled by it. Um, I now still watch it professionally. And I think everybody who knows that thinks that's really weird because that's like, that's not a regular sport, right? But I truly believe that there's some, you know, there's some innovation in that. And, and I really enjoy it. Thanks, Olga. Um, yeah, I know you're continuing with this theme of, right, STEM in basically, you name it. In fact, um, I'd love to uh, ask, maybe even challenge attendees, like, can you come up with something that's not STEM related, integrated, you know? Um, I, I often do that, by the way, when I uh, chat with kids, which I don't get to do very often, but sometimes uh, Talk STEM uh, has been having virtual events for nonprofit groups for children. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll just challenge them, go ahead, tell me. And so they'll come up with things like sleep. That's what one, one, one kid, like, you know, they were out to, you know how it is, right? With children, if you challenge them, they're gonna come up with something. So they tried all kinds of things that, nope, nope, you could look at that through data. You could look at that through the STEM angle. And then finally, someone said with a big smile on her face, sleep. Now, what are you going to say? <laughs> I said, well, maybe you got me, but you know, there is a whole analysis of sleep that's scientific. Um, so I guess we could argue that one. <laughs> um, um, I, when I do like a presentation for kids on, you know, take your kids to work day, um, I will show a bunch of pictures, like um, a picture of a 
street light, a picture of a, an iron, a picture of a computer and a picture of a dog. And I'll say, which one of these don't have any technology? And everyone will say the dog, the dog. I say, oh, well, this dog hasn't been implanted with a chip, you know, from the local humane society to ensure that if it goes missing, someone will be able to take it to the humane society and identify it. So nope, they all have technology. There you go. Well done. And that reminds me, speaking of animals, you know, one of our exciting projects that we've been working on is with the Dallas Zoo. Um, and so the fun thing is, you know, without getting into the details of what we, we did, but one of the things that we do is we develop these sort of STEM focused walking tours, right? If you can have an art tour, an architecture tour, why not a STEM tour? So that's what we were partnering with them on. And so I spent a lot of time at the zoo uh, and uh, one of the stops on this walk, the STEM walk was the, you know, giraffe habitat. And I can tell you that you could look at a giraffe and sure, I mean, I'm a biologist by background, so all of that stuff, but you can also look at it as an engineering marvel. I mean, have you seen giraffes gallop? How do they not fall down? It is totally an engineering marvel. So again, I'm gonna challenge people to please keep it up in the chat and tell us if there's anything that you would like to share that's got a kind of a interesting um, STEM dimension that you'd like to share and also if there's anything you feel does not have any STEM dimension and share that. All right, um, I'd like each panelist please to describe your, briefly your journey, your career pathway to where you are today. Some of you kind of touched on a little bit in your introduction. Also please share a high and or a low that you've experienced. Um, no particular order, but maybe just to, since we're on Zoom, uh, I'll start with Olga. Okay, well, like I mentioned before, um, my first 15, I call it the my two journeys, right? My first journey in life was in public relations and advertising for 15 years. And it was a phenomenal career. I, I mean, I loved everything that I did. But there was a point going back to your up and down, right? I had a really good career, it went up, I worked for Southwest Airlines, and I was very proud to be part of that team. But within that space, you really have to understand that there's a period in your time, in your life, that you have to find meaning, right? And now I kind of hit a low finding my meaning in life. I was about 30 something. That might be a little early for some people or late for some others. But for me, it was like, what is the meaning for my life? And that's where I hit a low within a high, right? And I decided to question where I was going in my life. And in I understood, even though I worked in a really great company with a great culture, I understood that it wasn't for them to make me happy. It was about me finding my happiness. And I decided there was a window and I, of, they were opening a window for retirement for people that had certain years. And I was like, this is the time to do this. Let me find my new high. And I became a teacher and I changed careers and I was 35 and people call me crazy. But let me tell you, it's the best thing I've ever done because I was able to embrace STEM in a way that I wanted to share with others. So I became a teacher, a bilingual teacher at Dallas ISD. Then I loved it so much that I became an instructional coach. And then after that, um, one of my principals said, you need to get into leadership because we're going to lose you. I don't know what we're going to do. And I, I got in into SMU to do my second master's in actual um, education leadership and followed along and continue with my doctorate in education and I became a principal. And hey, I have the best job in the world and I don't regret any decision made throughout that time. That's wonderful. And we should all uh, congratulate Olga because she just completed her doctorate. Uh, like a few weeks ago. So, um, so I, I can only imagine, you know, working as principal and working on a doctorate, like what, it, what that took. But clearly you are someone who is very committed to education and we are fortunate that you decided to make that transition. By the way, it's interesting that you mentioned that your background was in, um, previous career was in PR. I often say that uh, teachers, all educators really, um, but I always, when I was teaching um, teacher education programs at university, would tell them like, you know, you kind of have to put on your marketing hat and, you know, you're going to have all kinds of people in your classroom. Some of them are going to be like, oh yeah, I love science or I love math or whatever you're teaching and others, maybe not so much. So how do you kind of get them over to see that this is relevant to their life, which may look very different from the reason that that other kid loves it. So 
Um, that's probably a plus, right, in what you're doing right now. Thank you so much. Cassandra, would you please um, share a brief description of your journey to where you are today? Well, absolutely. And it looks like we've got a theme going on here. Follow your passion. I saw someone else in the chat that said, I switched jobs at 40 following my passion. And you heard me say that earlier as well. But I told you I was a chemical engineer and I studied that. It's, it's how I think I got on this panel as a STEM. But the reality is I never worked a day in my career in chemical engineering. And it was that love of math and science early on in the you know, high school years and followed through collegiate years. And after five years, I realized that wasn't my passion. It wasn't my purpose. And what was also beneficial though through that process for me is that I realized that I could leverage the discipline, the skill sets that I had learned and, and build upon them for problem solving, for looking uh, through a different lens in the perspectives that I bring to any job assignment or any role that I, that I have. And so I made that quick switch at the college time after interviewing for chemical engineering jobs and looking around at the lab coats and saying, I don't see myself here. So I was able to make the connection to hire in a, a career at IBM where I was able to really connect the dots between technical disciplines and the requirements uh, that they needed in order to do their job better with IT and the information systems uh, for I, that IBM offered. And so that was a great way for me to leverage the out aptitude that I had as well as the experiences to catapult it into new opportunities. And I've just found myself doing that at each step of my career ever since. So, I, you know, from Kimmy to what I would consider technical consulting, I then moved into banking where I was, uh, or sales to banking clients, which led me to become a chief technology officer at a bank. And from there, I moved into marketing and some of the lines of businesses within the bank. I did strategy work, merger and acquisition work. And then ultimately, as I joined Comerica, I had the opportunity to put those things together and uh, focused on building the products and services that we offer clients that led eventually to my leaving the retail bank. So it has been a really great journey. And somewhere along the way, I believe I became a banker. Uh, uh, so that was fun. That was fun also, as I got a chance to experience so many different things and just working through uh, just all of the things that brought me joy, but also giving me an opportunity to, to lead. So when I think about the high in that experience, there was a point where I worked my way out of a job. And it was the right thing, the recommendation for the work that I was doing at the time needed to be consolidated into something else. And I made that recommendation and found that that left me without a job. But it was the absolute best thing that could have happened to me because while I considered opportunities within the company that I was working with at the time, I similarly uh, decided this is the time to step out. And uh, with the severance package, I took a nine month paid sabbatical, which was the best opportunity when my children were young and I had such demands on uh, me from a career opportunity to take time out, really determine what it is I wanted to do in the next phase of my career and spend some time with family. So uh, it's turned into the best thing that could have happened to me. Thank you, Cassandra. That's, uh, that's so interesting. Uh, Maya. Sure. So I um, got a degree in English literature, which is not exactly a STEM field. Um, and, uh, and then I actually, Olga, I went and worked in advertising for several years. So we both have worked in advertising and in aviation. Um, and after doing that for a few years, I went back and got my MBA and American Airlines was recruiting um, at the school where I did my MBA and recruiting for an organization called Pricing and Yield Management. So this is where we set the fares at the airline and decide how many seats at each fare level to make available. 
And it was a really fascinating job. And, and I was super excited about it. And the flight benefits that come with working for an airline are pretty terrific. And so I thought, oh, I'll go do that for a year, you know, maybe two years at the most. And then, you know, 26 years later, I'm still there. Um, American's been a great company for me. I've had the opportunity to do lots and lots of different jobs in different areas. Um, I was at one point, I was the president of Advantage, which is our loyalty program, um, which also has some really interesting STEM aspects to it as well. When you think about how we um, how we give out miles, how uh, customers redeem miles for free trips, um, things like that. And then uh, I took this job as uh, the CIO responsible for the technology organization about eight years ago. And one of the highs in that time, um, well, I'll start with the low. One of the lows in that time was, uh, many of you know that American Airlines is the merger, is the product of a merger with another airline called US Airways. And I really wasn't prepared for how challenging an experience that was going to be. Um, you know, a lot of it was, it was challenging from a systems perspective to merge systems, but it was really way more challenging from a people perspective because people were very entrenched in their own cultures. Um, and it was hard to bring people together and let them recognize, have them recognize that they're part of a new airline. Um, and that was kind of a low until it turned into probably one of the biggest highs of my career because over time, uh, people do adapt and uh, we were successful at getting through to people and helping lead through this really challenging time. And then people really rallied around the mission of having a very successful systems integration with um, uh, it to create sort of the new American Airlines. So it was both a low and a high for me. And that's largely been my career. Thank you, Maya. Um, so it just it's interesting with all uh, three of the panelists, you know, a theme has been definitely as uh, someone mentioned, follow your passion, but also as a result, the fluidity and sort of cognitive and other flexibility that, you know, you three are definitely very adaptive people. And I would say that I would join you because even though I said I'm 30 years in education, but education is so broad, you know, I started out in this field as a middle and high school teacher uh, but then I went on and um, after getting my doctorate, did teacher preparation courses, uh, taught as a professor in a university, and then um, also got interested in community outreach work and uh, worked with lots of different community groups. And, you know, and that transition probably led me to, you know, found TalkSTEM, where again, TalkSTEM is really an umbrella organization that does a lot of different things. That's what keeps things interesting though, right? And I feel like a theme, particularly in the 21st century, is really, it becomes even more and more important for young people. You know, we always hear the jobs that our young people have may not even be around today. It's, it's tried but true. The importance of multiple literacies and skill sets, you know. Uh, and we have a question from our audience that I'll just throw out to the panel that relates to that. Uh, here's the question. As a university student who is going to be joining her first job soon, what tips do you have in terms of one, succeeding in the professional world? And two, what are the main skills I should focus on developing, especially if I want to have a leadership position one day? So I'll just, anyone who would uh, like to take a stab at that? Actually, I'll start. Uh, I, I really think that uh, as you are starting in the in a new career and anytime you start a new job, first and foremost, really do immerse yourself, understand the, the company, the culture, uh, understand the role in the job so that you are excelling. And the other aspect that I think is important, regardless of where you are in your career, is the continual learning and recognizing that you're going to be contributing. Uh, and a high expectation that you're contributing in the new role that you're in, but you're also going to continue to to learn and develop yourself and prepare yourself for yet that next opportunity. Uh, the last thing that maybe I'd offer is I always continue to I, I always focus on having a development plan for myself uh, from whatever job that I'm in to the things that I need to do and ensure that I'm successful in that space. But then the things that I'm doing that uh, is focused on where I ultimately want to uh, go. And so development, continual learning, 
and performance in the current job are certainly things that I would have you think about. I think those are all absolutely great points that Cassandra made, especially the part about being a lifelong learner. Um, I think what I would add is, look, you it's obvious that in order to advance in your career, especially into a position of leadership, number one, you have to be somebody who meets their stated objectives. You have to set challenging goals, you have to take initiative, and then you have to meet them. But what I would say is at least as important, if not way more important, is you've got to be somebody that people want to work with. People want to have you on their team. They want to um, be a peer of yours. And when you're starting off in a new job, it's important to remember that a lot of the people who will be starting with you are people that either will ultimately one day be working for you or you will be working for. And so it's really important to cultivate really, really good, strong relationships with your peer group as you're starting um, because your, your careers will advance at different rates and, um, and you just need to preserve really strong relationships in order to be successful. And I Thank do you. agree. With, and I do agree with Maya and with Cassandra. I mean, I, the rest, the first thing I wrote is relationships, Maya. That's that's number one, right, Cassandra? Relationships are everything. Um, the second thing that I would add on is um, how do you transfer the knowledge? The college knowledge versus the at work are, might be different. It might look different, but how do you transfer that knowledge into something that you can see and you can produce? And this. Third thing is that we don't ask for things, we build it. That's a big one in my life and it has helped, has helped me move forward is that there is no ideal workspace. There's no ideal. Nobody's going to give you everything that you wanted to be successful. You actually have to build it. You have to create your systems that work for you and that can support the team's goals. Because I can tell you that in my experience, I went into certain jobs having you know a vision of what I thought it should be, right? But that's not necessarily what you're gonna find. So how do you build this so that it becomes that dream job of yours? Thank you. Percy, I, would, I would love to add one more thing that sure, please. you think about, and it is find your resources. You're entering into a completely new environment and it is different as Olga was saying from the collegiate world to the, the work world, whether it's corporate or small business or whatever, but find your resources within that space so that uh, it, when, when you don't know where to turn or when you have questions or when you need advice, you have, you're starting to build those, uh, those people that you can trust it, uh, allies, if you will, that you can uh, turn to. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, excellent advice. And um, the terms, I mean, the terms, Culture and team come up repeatedly. I know, uh, and, and you, uh, you all refer to others too, but I would say that the term culture is something that I just want to echo. It's so important. Um, the culture of school, college, to the specific workplace you're going to. Um, when I look back to younger me, I realized I was very naive and I would just, just imagine that everything was, you know, I think when you're younger, at least for me, everything was very kind of, well, me related, right? So of course things are gonna be the way that I was used to. And then I'm like, oh wait, no, they're not. So kind of keep a really open mind, I would add, and understand that things can look different even if the field and the actual content may be very familiar to you, the ways of doing things. I mean, the technical term for culture, at least in education literature is knowledge, habits, and practices that are commonly, and values that are commonly adopted. So what are the habits, practices, and values? Kind of do a little assessment of that space. And then team, well, you know, what's great for teamwork is STEM. So there you go. Another reason to make sure to have some of those um, STEM experiences because it really is an excellent way to learn how to work really well in a team. Um, here's another question for the panel. A 2020 analysis of over 1,100 organizations found a leaky pipeline for women in leadership. 23% of executives currently are women 29% of senior managers are women, 37% of managers, and 47% of support staff. From your respective vantage points, how do you think about these numbers? They're obviously not ideal. How do we make change happen? 
as parents, as educators, as industry professionals, and so forth. Um, anyone feel like taking that on first? And then we can just add on. And I, like I say, we can keep this pretty informal and add on to each other's thoughts the way that we've been doing. So we know that women uh, and minorities as well are underrepresented in STEM careers. That's, that's actually part of, was part of my research. Um, there are a lot of stigmas that we put in ourselves and we have a lot of things in our head that just don't let us move forward. The first thing that I wanna say is that if you've not read this book called Mistakes I Made at Work, that was one of the best book. It was two, 20 years later, <laughs> late in my life that I read that book. But if you can read as a female leader that is moving ahead in STEM careers and in any career, read this book, please. Cause I read it 10 years ago and I was like, oh man, I wish I had read this book because it's people who are leaders, female leaders that have been in your position or where you wanna be and how they got there. So one of the things that they talk about is how are we supporting each other? We talked about, she talks about, this is, um, I can't remember her name and I can share later, but it's about finding your tribe, finding those people that will help you move forward. And it's not necessarily only women, it's just men as well in the workforce. Like who, who do you have in common? What are your values in common? So that we can help each other move forward. I would also have to really remind ourselves that we have the capability. In my research, one of the things that I found was that female leaders tend to overthink their, their own capabilities on their leadership. So a male will go for a job with only 75% of the requirements met. We need to be at 100% to only apply to the job. We need to get out of that mindset that we can't learn before or during the job. That is something that is holding us back. We think, oh no, that's too technical. That is too complex. We, I really need to master it before I get in. That is one mindset that is stepping us, that is moving us backwards instead of moving us forward. So my, my uh, advice again, read this book. I'm telling you, it's a life-changing book. And number two, that mindset that you have to have all the qualifications at 100% at a mastery for you to be able to get the job. Don't hold yourself, yourself backwards. You're your worst enemy. Yeah, I've seen that play out so many times. I have this great example of when a good friend of mine um, was, uh, there, there was a job available, a promotional opportunity, and she said, Oh, but I, I, you know, I've never done anything like that. I'm totally not qualified. And I said, well, you know, Rick is going for that job too. And Rick is somebody who had a very similar experience and background turn. She said, what? If he's qualified, then I'm qualified. So uh, it's, it's, and you're absolutely right. Part of it is mindset. Part of it is making sure that we're listening to our inner, our inner mentor rather than our inner critic. And, um, and really uh, having that mindset. And, and then, you know, the leaders of an organization have to be intentional about ensuring that at every level of leadership, we have the appropriate representation, whether it's women or minorities. And you can only do that through really careful intentionality. And you have to say, this is what I expect my leadership group to look like. And I'm going to set specific goals for me to achieve every year for our organization as collective to achieve every year and get everybody bought into that. Otherwise, it won't happen. We'll continue to have the leaky bucket that Koshi described. Wow, I, I had literally that stat, Olga, written down about men, women requiring 100% of confidence and competency in the requirements. And, and men, I said somewhere between 70 to 80. I didn't know the exact number. But I too see that play out so often in, in the environment that women don't have go into the roles or uh, be with the confidence that is necessary. And I think we need to lift women up and advocate for them and, and help them to recognize the potential that they have. Uh, and I think there are things that stem way back in schools and, and, and early childhood 
that we coddle you know, women and, and boys are put into team sports more uh, often and really improve their confidence in working together. And I think that's an opportunity that we need to master with, with our young girls and with women in, in the workplace. I also believe uh, that there is, as Maya mentioned, much greater emphasis and focus awareness on diversity and inclusion and setting the expectation and leveling the playing field for women and minorities in uh, key roles within the workplace. Uh, we certainly recognize that there is significant value that comes from diverse perspectives. And when you get a diverse group of people sitting around the table, we're raising the, the value propositions and the decision-making capability and ultimately the contribution to the business. And that uh, just is a win-win for everyone. So uh, absolutely agree with all the points made and our encouragement and the work that we're doing in that regard matters significantly. Thank you and absolutely couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, it's, um, you know, the time might be ripe for some real change. A lot has happened in the last year. So hopefully things, the numbers that I quoted earlier uh, when I raised the question to the panelists, um, hopefully in the near term, we can see some real change. Um, that would be most excellent. Um, we have a question. Uh, so maybe each of you can speak just very quickly for a minute or so about the question that came from the audience. Can each of you speak to the aspect of STEM that specifically you feel you use in your current role, um, if any, or can you just speak to how your STEM experiences um, uh, or STEM learnings uh, shape the work that you do? I'll start with that one, Koshi. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, for me, it's problem solving. And as I think about the things that I learned in math and science curriculums over time, they typically allow you to assess a situation and determine what the solution is. And there's a path that you go through in order to do so. That I feel that is a useful skill set, regardless of the environment that you're working in. And if you're working in a with a community group around a problem, around looking at data and facts and leveraging the facts in order to assess what's going on, assess the problem, and ultimately to develop solutions. That's probably the key uh, one that I use on a day-to-day -day basis in leadership. Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, when I first heard that question, I was like, well, duh, that's obvious. I run the technology organization. I'm the T in STEM. And, but I realized that, you know, to Cassandra's point, me personally as a leader, it, our, I'm really um, doing a lot more around problem solving and hypothesizing and experimenting. That's really where I'm encouraging my organization to go. In technology, we're asking people to build things that have never been built before, and they don't know if what they're doing is going to work. And collectively, we don't know if we're actually what we're doing is actually going to solve the business problem. So what we're really asking people to do is to just act like scientists, develop a hypothesis, do the, the least amount of work we can do in order to test the hypothesis. And then based on the data that we receive, make a decision about what the next best action is to take. And um, I think that's where STEM really comes into play in, in, my, in my role. And I can say it sounds, it might sound obvious, right? I'm running a school, I'm building a school and, and we, all, we have all of the science and we have all the math, but to build a school that is relevant right now in this new century, you have to use engagement tools and enhance the learning through technology. So that's one of the reasons why we are building the first gamification platform for learning in our school, where our kids will actually go into a world, like a virtual world, an enhanced virtual world, where they will have avatars, where they will be able to problem solve, and they will be able to build new worlds using all that STEM knowledge and problem solving, like Cassandra was saying, and Maya as well, so that they can get those 
21st century and 22nd century skills that our workforce are needing right now for them to be successful because it is not fair to them to be learning in the way that we used to learn because they're not living in the world that we used to live. They're living in a new world. They're digital babies. There's research about how they were born in this digital world, right? We, we grew up into it. They were born into it. So why are we teaching them in the same way? So the applications of enhancements through technology, through engineering, through math and science is a great way to prepare our kids, all Dallas kids and all the nation's kids into the real needs of the 22nd century that is coming up. Thank you all. Um, and um, I know that Claire and uh, Claire and I chatted, and she's not here today, as we mentioned, but um, you know, in the work that she does, there are so many positions that um, young children today, most of us, I certainly didn't know about it, uh, that exist, such as chief remote officers and so forth, new leadership positions that didn't exist even a few years ago. Uh, the future of work is changing fast and flexibility is the name of the game as uh, the women in this panel have already talked about. And Shelly, who thought she wasn't a science person, but now she knows she is. Um, so keeping yourself willing to learn and being flexible, I think that seems to be key. And understanding that STEM, so many times when, you know, I meet all kinds of people and they say, oh, you're STEM, so you do robotics or you do coding. And I'm like, um, nope, don't do robotics, don't do coding, don't know how to code. Oh, so what do you do? You're not really STEM. Um, so it's really kind of pushing that boundary and what do we mean by STEM? And, and I think you've answered that question also that it can look very different in different spaces. Of course, it encompasses robotics and astrophysics and coding and lots of other things um, and teamwork and problem-based uh, problem and project-based learning and so on and so forth. So really it's, uh, and we call this, uh, we name this, um, discussion STEAM, because we definitely see the connection between arts and humanities, uh, Maya, case in point, right? Uh, the importance of communication, right? Teamwork, uh, the quote unquote soft skills are no longer the soft skills. It's kind of, we're living in a time that's transdisciplinary. It's very different from how most of us went to school. And so we're at a challenging point, certainly when it comes to education. Um, all right, uh, time is running along. So let me uh, ask a few last questions to our panelists. Um, so Olga, you're in the process of dreaming up a brand new school uh, of a very different sort, as you mentioned. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the rationale for this type of school. I mean, uh, is it related to the pandemic or not? Or you know, why, why the school, why at this point in time? Well, so it was this school has been in in the thinking process and the planning process for almost two years before we actually said this is the time to do it. Um, it does not come as a consequence of the pandemic. It actually comes as a response to the higher learning model that is happening right now. Some of you might have college students right now, like my son is at Texas A&M, and he has to go to college twice a week and then learn from home three times a week. And if you've been through graduate school recently, again, like I have, you have to do a lot of learning online. So our school is actually a response to ensuring that our kids are getting ready for that model that they will, in, they will encounter in the next few years when they go to college. It's a model where we build self-efficacy, we enhance their learning with technology and additional skills through a gamified platform that is right now a great way of socialization that they're using. If you have a son or a daughter that is a gamer, you know that they socialize. We think that they're not socializing, they're socializing with 500 people or four friends that they have in school. That it's the same thing as we used to go outside and, and ride our bikes, right? We would go to the neighborhood, we would ride our bike and we would talk to our friends. They do it now in their headsets. And that's how our kids are engaging right now in learning, even though we, sometimes we don't think like that it's learning. So again, this is not a response to COVID. This is actually a response to the real world needs and like you said, Koshi, the remote, what is it, official, what is it, C, uh, yeah, chief remote, chief officer. remote officer will be managing teams 
from home, from remote places, and will be earning a great living using this technology. And that's what we want for all of our children in Dallas. So I shouldn't just grab the headset away from my son every time I see it. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Cassandra, many would say, and you've spoken a little bit about this uh, during this time we've had together, many would say that your engineering education has very little to do with your work as a banking executive today. Can you give us a few, and you pointed out that, you know, you've used some of the problem and project-based learning approaches. Can you give us a couple of, um, even one specific example of how your engineering mindset uh, how you see your engineering mindset being applied to your current work as a banking executive. Yes, thanks. Uh, Koshi, you're right. I have uh, mentioned a little bit about the problem solving and just to you know, explore that a little further, I really think that always starting with the end in mind uh, and a vision of where you're going is another aspect of uh, STEM to leadership, to problem solving and ultimately to contributing at a higher level. Uh, I think it's so much so important that you have those uh, standard set of processes. Uh, what is the problem statement? What is the success statement? What are the, the metrics that you would expect to measure your progress on that leads us to better outcomes overall? I typically find that I ask a lot of why questions, um, somewhat ad nauseum to uh, some, but before you start to do work and, and thereby before you need to do rework along the way. And so those are uh, opportunities that allow us to uncover inefficiencies along the way and or to ensure that we're exploring alternatives as opposed to just the first path that comes to mind. Ultimately, that leads to better outcomes. So the other thing I would tell you is I'm always thinking around the risk. And how do you uh, reduce the risk associated with work that you do, reducing variability and driving consistent outcomes? All of those really lead to, from that engineering background, that discipline and disciplined approach to evaluating work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, as I mentioned, it certainly makes me a better banker, but absolutely a better leader. Thank you so much. Um, Maya, in your position at American Airlines, you're constantly working on the evolution of innovations. Tell us about some interesting innovations over the last year. Um, well, yes, it has been quite a year. And if you had asked, you know, this time last year, like what was on our priority list, it would not have been the things that we actually ended up doing. Um, one good example is this idea of a touchless kiosk. So when you go to the airport and you see those self-service machines where you can check in, um, you know, at, given the, the uh, issues around COVID and, and the desire from our customers for uh, a hygienic and safe experience, um, customers no longer wanted to touch the kiosks themselves. And so how did we, how do we create a, you know, a, an experience in which they could use them to check in, but not actually touch them? Um, you know, at the beginning of March, that was like not, you know, that would have never been something that we would have considered. And then by, you know, this time in March or in April, I guess, it was like our number one priority. And, um, and you know, uh, sort of solving that problem was, uh, you know, applying a really innovative thought in the end, what we ended up doing is sort of putting a QR code on the, on the, you know, basically the front screen of the kiosk that you could scan with your phone, which would render a piece of the application on your phone and allow you to check in using your phone rather than, than going through the kiosk itself. So, um, you know, interesting things like that. Obviously, there was an enormous need to communicate about COVID, you know, where we were flying, where, uh, when you flew somewhere, what were the restrictions around that? What sort of testing was required? What sort of quarantining was required? If you were going to travel somewhere, our hotels open, our restaurants open. Um, what, you know, what is, what, what was, what, basically, what was involved in flying over this past year? So there was a lot of innovation around just communicating um, with our customers, cleaning the planes, ensuring that they were cleaned so thoroughly that there was no risk of, of uh, um, can, uh, anything spreading 
while you're on the plane. Um, you know, in addition, we had grounded a lot of planes and uh, because there was no demand for flying and there really isn't, you know, the airline, the, the planes are meant to fly. There isn't, there aren't processes in the airline that are designed to allow planes not to fly. And so we had to create new processes like ensuring that planes were moved a certain amount each day um, while they were grounded so that they weren't resting on the tires in the same place for multiple days in a row. So it's it was just a really interesting year in terms of the challenges that we faced and the innovations that we um, put in place in order to deal with the year. Thank you. Yeah, it's I can, I can only begin to imagine what this year has been like for you in the airline industry. And yeah, it's been really remarkable uh, just you know from the news, et cetera, to see that uh, airlines have done a really good job. So thank you so much for all your work. Um, this has been my greatest pleasure and my honor to chat with uh, you all, uh, Shelly, Maya, Olga, and Cassandra. Your, thank you for giving up your time. I know that you're all very, very busy uh, women and uh, really appreciate it. Um, I really, um, we're going to wrap up in the next five minutes, Melissa and I, um, I know some people have to go, um, but uh, I just wanted to say that I would love to invite you all again, as Cassandra mentioned, the Hearst M. Lenz exhibition, you saw uh, these wonderful panelists' uh, contributions. Um, it's really a unique, if I do say so myself, a series of exhibitions uh, on a fun VR platform. Um, it's great for your daughters uh, as well. Um, and for your students, it's great for boys as well. I mean, you know, they're just, they're not gender specific kinds of questions or topics. Um, and it's all free, thanks to Comerica. And um, I actually was in a um, virtual conference presenting a couple of weeks ago and a high school junior, a girl um, from New York uh, was on there and I had the students go in and explore the exhibition. I just wanted to share her question or her comment. And her comment, and this is a high school junior in New York City um, who said, you know, was, what she was taken by her takeaway was that as you can tell from the contributions these people shared today, the focus is on the question. So a STEM lens is equal to photo plus question. And for me, STEM is all about questions as Cassandra talked about just now. Um, and she loved the fact that it was a bunch of girls and women being exhibited who shared their questions, given the fact that in her opinion, in society, women were frequently not voicing questions and just the loud voice of women and their questions was what she loved about it. That made me feel good, but it also made me feel a little sad that a young girl in this day and age was saying that about society today. So clearly there is definitely room for improvement. Um, I'm gonna wrap up and then Melissa is, thank you all. We will share this video on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in sharing, it will be there. I hope you will join the Talk STEM community, open to all those in the STEAM learning or teaching ecosystem. And that's pretty much everybody who see the connection between STEAM and the world. And as Shelly has pointed us to, that's everything. So that's everybody. Um, so as parents, educators, mentors, whatever your roles are, I hope you'll participate in our events, initiatives, volunteer if you're interested. For those of you with kids, high schoolers are welcome. Um, you can donate, any amount is great. Stay connected as we continue to work to close the systematic opportunity gaps that unfortunately exist in our society. Over to you, Melissa. Thanks, Koshi. Thanks, panel. Thanks, Shelley. Learned a lot tonight. I think it's a great discussion. Um, if you want to get involved and you liked what you heard tonight and you want to help fill the gap that is occurring within STEM and STEAM and get more women and people of color involved in technology, join us at Chick Tech Dallas. You have a great opportunity now to make a direct impact on your community. We're looking for leaders. So if you want to get your ideas heard and if you want to get involved, we're looking for people to join our leadership team right now. So reach out to us at dallas.chicktech.org. Everyone will also receive a link after this panel to provide feedback so we can continue the discussion and set up a series of the continued panels. You'll also be able to ask if you want more information about Chick Tech Dallas or Talk STEM. We'd love to have you. I recently relocated from Denver to Dallas and that's how I actually met Koshi and she has been a joy to work with. 
Uh, and I can tell you, Chick Tech Denver has only been up and running for about four years now, and they've already helped hundreds of students. And so we hope to continue that mission here in Dallas. Thanks again for joining us. This will be posted on all of our social media handles. So we look forward to you tuning in and joining us in our next discussion. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good Bye. Night. Thank you. Good Bye. Night. Thank you, Koshi. Thank, Thank you, everyone, Melissa. for joining Bye, us. Everyone. Thank you, Koshi, for inviting us. This was great. We can speak. We can talk all night. It was great. <laughs> cool. A little bit of wine and yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much.